Hello and welcome to another episode of the Everything's Been Done podcast, conversations in cycling subculture. I'm your host, Dustin Klein. Today's episode is brought to you by the director's cut of the latest EBD episode, Single Track Candyland. It's got the camper van. It's got a bodybuilder. There's a frit witch. There's even some poached drone footage. It's the greatest thing since a, the regular version. It's just longer with more of the stuff like food and more camper van things. You'll love it. Trust me. I hope. Today's guest is an artist, designer, and a frequenter of flow. You can find him on Instagram at Alonzo Tall. Please welcome the one and only Alonzo Tall. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Yeah? Things are things are yeah, pretty good. Kind of just doing what they are. How are you holding out with all the whole pandemicness, the new life? As I've been telling all my friends or just many people, I'm just hanging in there weathering the storm, doing what I can do, head down, working, but not stuff that uh, make me stuff to, you know, put out. And I'm going to get time to say the least on that. And obviously there's a lot of other things going around the world, going around the country that are very, uh, you know, testy right now. So obviously that's in the ethos. Right, for sure. Yeah. I mean, but I, I'm, not, I'm not really one to always dwell on like kind of, trauma or kind of issues i kind of get in one and kind of figure out what's going on out there for for like a better word uh, i kind of always been living through it and living in it so nothing new to me and that's probably goes to say with any other person of color or black person for that matter right yeah it's more like oh so everyone, been here. everyone just decided to realize what was happening yeah yeah pretty much yeah but i mean i guess that's better than not you know, you don't, yeah. That is true. Because otherwise, true, 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 true. you're just like, the fuck, tearing your hair out. Like, oh, the con- oh, I definitely hope the conversation's not going anywhere, and I don't think uh, we're going anywhere. Black <laughs> people are in America, too. Just not you're going not anywhere. You're not going anywhere, no. <laughs> not going anywhere. No. It's a little hot sometimes, but I'm not going anywhere. Have you been able to ride your bike and stuff during all this? Yeah. Off and on, I started like riding, you know, solo. And then I have a, so one of my roommates is my teammate. So like we rode, oh, uh, but he has a business, uh, bicycle coffee. So he's always like into like going to the shop and then riding like kind of closer to sunset from about like five to seven, like every other day. So we get that. And then I get my solo riding in. Are you, tr- I guess nobody's training for anything right now, but are you on kind of like a schedule with how often you're riding? <laughs> Can I just say I've never actually even owned a power meter, so yeah. well, or use one? Were you try? Were you yeah, I know, uh, I know. Okay, I know, but I just I'm just riding hard at that point. There's a whole bunch of people training, and then I'm riding really hard. Yeah, but or often. All right, I, I, I'm not training. Okay, <laughs> I'm not training at all. <laughs> but like, how often are you able to get out in a week? I can get out every day if I want, but I think I've been doing it at least about four to five times. Oh, that's that's impressive. Yeah, but I don't own a car, so like riding is like kind of like in, it's like every day for me. It's my life. I was gonna ask <laughs> you that if it's still. I saw an old interview with you from like 2013. And you're like, I don't own a car, and I was like, Oh shit! I'm gonna ask him that if that's still the way it is. Still a thing. Uh, there's nothing in between me not getting it. just haven't happened. I've always been like moving, like the type of work that I have. Like I could take a job in in Minnesota, <laughs> but you know I kind of keep myself uh, very minimalistic and kind of ready to move and make changes. Um, but it's kind of I mean outside looking in, even have visiting. You live in Los Angeles and you don't own a car. Mm-hmm. That's so radical. Yeah, true. Yeah, I just ride my bike every day, pretty much. Gnarly. Yeah, I mean, respect. Um, but you're, There's times you have to troubleshoot and think ahead, like far and ahead uh, to make things happen, but I've uh, always, you know, kind of made them happen. Yeah, that makes sense, because sometimes the distance is so great that it's like, am I going to spend two hours to get to this thing or not? Yeah, sometimes I just don't go. <laughs> well, yeah, that well, which makes perfect sense. It's like... 
<laughs> I don't have the extra four hours to get to that event, so uh, not that events even exist anymore, but if they did, I wouldn't be there. Yeah, but <laughs> race-wise, it was always like, well, I got teammates who have like cars, so they're going to the race. I guess I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, when you were racing, were you racing, what disciplines were you focusing on? Um, mostly, uh, fixed gear criteriums and then road criteriums. And then later into like the, you know, the cat three and like cat two stages. Like I started to do some of the road races with the guys. Um, so that like stage races, like, uh, uh, DSR, um, and then some other ones. And that was all with the concept team? Yeah, most of that stuff, most of my road racing was uh, with the concept team, yeah. And maybe you can clarify for me, I've always thought of concept of through like you and through, um, oh, I'm totally blanking, the, the Enzo, that's the kit manufacturer. Endo. 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 Thank Endo you. Endo Custom, yeah. Did it start with that and then, because Justin Williams, oh, that's Legion, for some reason, I was like, what is the same? But there's a connection there, too, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there's a big connection there. I think uh, back in 2013, 14, when I started writing for Bahati Foundation, uh, that was like one of the first actual clubs I was with uh, roadwise okay. and then racing teams. Um, I met Justin through Rathon, and we connected, and uh, Bobby Indo had worked previously with him at rock and republic he was one of the designers for rock and republic which housed justin and uh rasan uh in her professional career and uh was he that a, a race had a team? shop yeah that was a race team okay. it was a pretty rad race team that uh that was uh, early 2000 ish okay yeah 2004 ish, five ish around that time uh i'm probably wrong but yeah it was um, in the past it was in the past. Uh, it was definitely in the past. But it was it was awesome. It was like a very big switch in terms of like who was on that team, the design of the team, how much cachet they kind of had in the scene. I think they even had like Sick. Ivan Dominguez. And I might be wrong with that too, but I think I might be right. Yeah. Um, anyways, he had a shop downtown and I would pass by and I would see the, you know, the kids around town and he made a lot of custom stuff and uh, one night I decided to pop in because I seen movement in the shop and I knocked on the door and they're like, Oh, what's up? I know you, you're my track bike. You ever thought of like doing some kids and I was like, hell yeah, I do some kids. So we did some stuff together. And I think like after my first season of racing with, uh, Bahati foundation, I was like, I'm the only one like really trying to race. Like I need like, a, I want to be around a team after seeing the whole community of racing. And I was, you know, I had, uh, wanted to be a part of a team. So I was looking at some local ones, but nothing really just kind of rang, rang out to me. And one night I had stopped by and Justin was there uh, doing some uh, custom kits for their track nationals. And we, we just sat there and talked. Uh, me and Bobby had some drinks. Justin didn't drink anything. And then we were just talking about cycling and what we wanted that to be. And live and behold, we kept having that conversation. And then one night we all went out to dinner and we kind of said, hey, let's make a team of like kind of cat two, cat three uh, guys that, you know, will develop them and kind of do what we want to do as a concept. So we kind of like uh, came up with a group of guys that, you know, from like a cat two, cat three and then some cat one. And kind of met up and said, hey, this is what we're trying to do. We're going to keep it kind of really simple and develop something that was going to be, I guess, built along the way. It was a concept. It was just an idea. And that's how we kind of uh, started that. So it was myself, Justin, and uh, Bobby Endo, who started the concept team originally. Um, and I could say if you had to put an ownership, it was like very equal. It was kind of like a trilateral agreement with uh, Endo at the top kind of funding a lot of it through the kits and like kind of being the uh, partnership sponsor uh, and the manager as well, just trying to like get companies to say, hey, let us get a pro deal. Hey, let us get some bikes. And he kind of like drew that narrative. My job was kind of just to, you know, like for like a better word, make it cool and like kind of have a creative strategy about like how we we're going to post and 
what our imagery was going to look like and try to tell that story, you know, slowly but surely over time and just kind of do us without having like the big brand kind of barking down orders. So like the roof was, you know, sky was the limit without the kind of that, bar- that sponsorship barrier that a lot of teams face. Right. With them being in charge and telling you guys what to do was concept then was Justin on concept. Were you, on it were you actually racing so, I, you just I was like actually i was actually a writer so i was okay, actually a I writer thought. and doing those things and then uh justin was on um estella i believe at the time and then he slowly he went to um in cycles um team which uh, i'm like drawing blanks uh um can, can silence. We... Yeah, it was a silence team that was sponsored through uh, Cannondale at the time. Oh, so he wasn't on a team until like, uh, like until the later dates of the you know his career where he like wanted to departure, and then there wasn't a silence team, and they kind of like uh, his brother Corey was on K to elevate, and he was kind of just, just riding solo at the time, and uh, just kind of sponsored by various companies like Asus just to kind of like be riding in something and have some some type of support. And I worked at Asus as well, and switched. Uh, also to Switzerland, but I was based in uh, Salt Lake City. Right, which also, that I mean, that's a great segue. I was curious of how, you, so you grew up in L.A., uh, uh-huh. track bikes, that whole thing, and then you ended up mo- yeah. moving to Utah to work with Asos, Asos? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? Asos or Asos, whatever you like. Right. At this point, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, how was that experience for you? It must have been culture shock on many levels. Uh, <laughs> um, it was a, I wouldn't say necessarily, I wouldn't say culture shock, just more of like a deepening into like the things that I had already kind of been interested in years and just like the extension of that. So it went from like fixed gear bikes on the street and road racing and criterium to like mountain biking and hiking and skiing and snowboarding as to like what was happening in Salt Lake City. And then in terms of like working with the Asos as a brand, it was like one of those heritage brands that had really made some really influential products. Like the actual chamois that we all kind of used was like developed in house and kind of, you know, pushed out to the world uh, through Asos. And I guess to some degree, other companies also to not be named, but I think Asos really kind of held that true for sure but with their bids it's one of the best in the world yeah and th- how was that experience working with them like did you did you enjoy it was it cool to be like inside the industry on such a high level because that's a that's a top tier yeah <laughs> it, it was um it was very shocking in the sense of like man i'm just a little city boy from watch california uh and that kind of Grew up in my teenage years in Lemur Park, and now, you know, getting a chance to go back and forth in between, you know, Utah, Los Angeles, and Switzerland, like, every two to three months. And there was a lot of weight on my shoulders to kind of change the visual perception on on a social media, because I was their global social media manager. Oh, okay. I could change that from, like, their reputation without even kind of knowing them that much. I just had, like, an agenda just to clean it all up. I kind of had this like, you know, George Bush to Obama years, like I had to be Obama or some shit like that. Like I just like had to clean up a lot of little things that they had done in the past that were like pretty racy. And I was always navigating away from that. But um, long story short, as a social media manager, having so much to be in charge of like that, um, you run into different cultures and different cultures of people who are not familiar with working with you or kind of, even thinking that you kind of belong there, you're kind of just, you know, tolerated rather than kind of being celebrated for like how you got there. It's just like, how did you get here? You know, I don't understand what you're saying. People expected you to be there or they expected. To, I don't know what you're saying. I'm confused. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just meaning like uh, they, they, they had no idea that like I was actually African-American when they met me. Like they were like, just That's tolerating me being there. Sick. Wait, tolerating you? I don't understand. Yeah, just tolerating me being there. Well, they just tolerated that, like, I had that position. They didn't really celebrate, like, oh, we can make some real change here. And he's going to help us guide us through that. Oh, interesting. And then I'm, 
Because, so you, I'm confused because it's, Take your time. are they not knowing you and then they're suddenly seeing, or they're, they're communicating with you and then they're seeing you or you're working with them. I'm so, but well, I'm working on so many, I'm working on so many different levels in, in terms of just not just Switzerland, but like Brazil and, and like, you know, like they're distributors in Germany, their distributors in Italy, and then the Tel Aviv, no matter where that was, it was just always like, oh, we have to kind of like listen to this guy and like kind of believe where he's going to take us. And it was just like a very slow train to get there. And it just felt like they were just tolerating me telling them what to do versus like, yeah, we're on board 100%. I always felt like I was just being tolerated. Why? Well, I just always felt like no one was ever truly 100% on board with what I was trying to achieve outside of my office in Salt Lake City. Sure. Everyone around the world kind of had this thing. It was just like, who is this American kid telling me what to do? Like, I see what you're trying to do, but man, like, why do I have to do it? And then it was your job to change the, the global brand positioning? Is that what it is? Yes. Oh, so then, and then on social media. Okay. And then I guess they're not, where's their headquarters? Is it America? Their headquarters is in uh, Switzerland. Switzerland. Stabia. Totally. So then America does social media for the, for the globe. America is head of social media. At the globally. time. At the time. So that's confusing. At the headquarters time, yeah. is here. Head of this thing is over there. Like. So confusing. <laughs> no one man should be doing that one job at the end of the day how about that totally like way too much on your plate and then having to deal with all these countries it sounds overwhelming yeah i'm probably not even explaining you right it's been i've like already like let all that stuff kind of go and just move moved on so i'm probably not even explaining it right but anyway it, moving on. it just it wasn't a match for you yeah but um I'm, long term no when right, i first got yeah. there i was stoked long term no yeah. Like I went to a lot of awesome races like Tour California where it's like so, this was awesome to be on the road two years in a row doing that stuff, printing the leader's jersey and oh, all that do, type of stuff. It was how awesome. do they do that? How do they print um, a jersey? Basically, on the road? we would print over like a hundred team slides or little transfers and we would oh. already have the jerseys pre made and we would have like more than like 300 jerseys ready to go that are also custom jerseys that are kind of blank. And uh, we would, uh, if you let me go, I think I have one that's blank over there. I could kind of show you, but then we would keep press them after we got the transcripts from the UCI. And then we would print the, the leader's jersey, the yellow jersey, the polka dot jersey, the best young rider, and my favorite, the sprinter jersey. Right on the spot within like 20 seconds after the finish. So I would get the finish for Instagram and then run to the back, get my guy ready to go. If we kind of like knew cycling and knew who was going to be in a certain jersey based off the numbers that we knew, we would kind of prep it, but we wouldn't print it. Right. And then we would get the transcript, print it, and then uh, I would shuttle it up to the podium and get it going. Yeah. Damn, that's fun. Wait, so you had to be at the, you had to get the shot at the finish line? Like is It was cool to do it. No, but is that really hard to do? Because it feels like there's always a shitload of people in there. Oh, yeah, there was. Is I was it? just like on a mission. Just, <laughs> I like that. All so right. I had like a phone and I would just like get the phone and get a few shots and then, you know, haul ass back to the green area where all the pro racers are coming in and it's just them Sick. and their uh, and their swannies kind of like getting them all their new feed and their like recovery drinks and they're like, taking off their clothes and putting on fresh bibs and like getting ready to see what size Jersey fits well, because they're going to race in these Jersey uh, tomorrow. And then the podium jerseys are kind of like long sleeves and you kind of put them on backwards. So yeah. those don't matter. Those right. are important, but they don't matter. Just the race day Jersey for the next day kind of mattered with size. So we would just like go back there and kind of get in them size. And sometimes people wanted to, if I knew you like a, like a Karim Rivera was there, I'd be like, make sure a printer like three jerseys to give to her parents and maybe your team, Sick. you know, cool stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this, oh, it is, for some reason in my head, I'm thinking this is in like a fucking RV or like a mobile, I mean, isn't it, is it? No, it was in the green room. 
Uh, some some in uh, in Europe they are right. Yeah, like the tour, there's not a lot of room to like set up something. Yeah, there's like they're in like a little RV or a little little, little ninja Dude. samurai type of little jam. That's fucking cool. What the fuck? Like this portable, like team printing. <laughs> it's yeah, like printing mi- jerseys on the spot, and they last pretty long too. I've seen uh, some. I've had them for like a while now. Oh, that from makes... the first year to the second year. Yeah, they're kind of disposable. They're not like top tier. They're just to. They're really for one day. Technically, um, Athos makes top tier stuff, so I'm yeah. not gonna lie for that. Uh, they are pretty durable and pretty good. They were one of my favorite jerseys that they had for a long time. I didn't really care for a lot of their tops, except for those jerseys because they were like really light and race day ready, and they were like kind of like really nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, again, in my head, I was thinking that they would be like kind of the cheapest, like fastest, you know. But n- I mean, because Asos is like a it's a it's an expensive brand so they're gonna project expensive shit yeah yeah huh interesting uh i was reading a thing online about how you learn how to ride a bike i thought that was pretty insane actually do you do you remember that <laughs> where'd you read this at on the internet man there's all kinds of crazy shit like out where there. Uh... my sources are secret my friend Okay. 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 Uh, um, yeah. I mean, uh, are you, is it the one where about BMX bikes or more about track bikes? I actually heard two conflicting stories about your cousin's bike. One of them was a BMX bike, and one of them was a ten speed. And I was like, we got to get to the bottom of this. So his, uh, my cousin definitely had both of those bikes. He. Uh, would let me like kind of ride the BMX bike, but I really was interested because oh. the 10 speed just looked cooler and it was like blue and it had like all this stuff and you could like, it had, I was just attracted to like all the stuff on it. The BMX bike was super cool, but like, you know, it was like a GT, I believe at the time. Um, I smoked a lot of those memories away, smoking weed. So they might be conflicting, but um, <laughs> I remember crashing it into a wall. That's why I asked which one, because they're, just totally different bikes and different well, you, experiences. You crashed the 10... So actually, the, what I was... Crash the 10 feet. Did you learn how to actually ride a bike on the BMX bike? Yes. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And did you actually... Did you learn with training wheels? Or did you just fucking... No. Start doing no, it? No, no, no. There was no training wheels. Yeah. It was just a coaster break. Yeah. No, but did There's anybody no help you? Wheel. Keep you upright? Uh, No. No, no, no. It just kind of like got on it, man. I can't, I don't really have the, the direct memory of it. I do remember like where I was. I was in like the Jordan Down project and it was like my cousin's bike that was like also his brothers and his other little brothers and yeah. kind of just getting on it, seeing it in the yard, getting on it and riding it and just kind of like twirling around. Of course, I probably fell like once or twice, but oh, yeah. like riding a bike once yeah, you yeah. kind of get it, it doesn't really go away. Huh. That's sick. Yeah, that's funny. You were interested in the ten speed because it had like a like a cockpit of just like shit to fuck with. You're like Datatron, six to that, this and that. <laughs> yeah, I never think about. Yeah, that. it wasn't until like my late like almost adulthood until like I actually got a bike and I would ride bikes forever since then. Oh yeah, what was that? How did that end up happening? That came through. Uh, one of the maintenance men, maintenance men who uh, worked on like apartment building that I was in had a 84 Bianchi track bike. Apparently he was a messenger in New York for a while. Wow. And uh, he seen me riding my BMX bike uh, from like a Hollywood and Highland station, which was maybe about seven miles from my house. And I used to go to the school, school out in the Valley. Um, but after school, oh, I would just shit. like ride my bike and get on the bus and, you know, get back into the uh, LA side. Um, he seen me and was like, Hey, I got this bike. Um, I'll help you buy wheels for it. Uh, if you paint like two of these houses. So I painted some apartments that summer and he got me all laced up and I ended up cracking the down tube because it was like an old kind of like rusty bike. It was a track bike, original, like dope track bike. And, uh, 
he ended up feeling like really bad. I painted one more apartment and we went and got like a Fuji track pro or something like oh, that sick. or Fuji track from like a performance bike shop in like Pasadena. And I'm thinking this is maybe 2006, the summer of 2006. Sick. And I didn't really ride it that much. I rode it around town throughout the summer, but once school started, I kind of like went back into school running track and field and cross country. And then like that following summer, I got an internship and then like I started riding it a lot more because I had met people in and around the town and downtown and so on and so forth. Totally. So it was, it was almost more like utilitarian or like a uh, transportation. Yeah. I was a commuter. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, Oh, what's the coolest way to commute? And you're like, it's that, that bike for sure. Yeah. So I did like, I guess the fixy thing by myself for a while for like a good two to three years. Like I didn't really know a lot of people until like I stumbled upon some stuff on Tumblr, uh, oh. uh, just seeing like track bikes in like, uh, like Seattle and then like obviously San Francisco and then being in LA and then like match doing their thing. And then like kind of connecting like some of the dots around like my own city with like rides like VCR and uh, the players ride and like other bike shops orange 20 and like now all these people are like all my some of my closest friends so it just kind of like organically sprouted into what is now whatever it is now when did the did the maintenance dude did he teach you how to ride that bike like did he let you borrow his he, he didn't he didn't let me ride his road bike oh he his had a road let bike. me ride oh. yeah he had a rope he had a road bike he didn't let me ride his road bike um oh. he thinks this whole he would think this story is hilarious um he basically tried to teach me how to skid and kind of almost just like killed himself and then you basically you got to kind of like do your legs like this and this is how they skid this is how the kids skid but i don't know and i remember how stoked i was when i did a girlfriend skid it was like holy smokes like i did it and it's smoking and i smell rubber That's oh sick. shit Sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what it is. Shut up, dude. But then yeah. he. So but then, I was like by myself. I wasn't celebrating with other people. I was just like, oh god, I think I know how to do it. Just try it. Did you did you build that track bike up and had never while never riding one? I'm saying that really weird. But did you ever ride a track bike before you built up the bike that he hooked you up with? No. What in the hell? No. He's like, yo, you ride a BMX bike? You would like this bike that you can't try until you build it. <laughs> he told me about it, but it didn't okay. register. Six gear did not register at all. I was just like, you just got to keep pedaling and you slow down. So I was just doing like the hard press pedal to slow down. You're just like this, you know? So all I was doing until that one day, like a couple of days, maybe like a week or two in, I had seen, like I said, pictures on the and they were just pictures and i seen yeah. dudes leaning over their handlebars which is like a you know a, a track comp or like a skid comp or whatever nowadays oh, how we yeah. would think about it and i remember seeing it and i was like okay i'm doing it <laughs> and then you lock it up and you're like oh snap yeah i'm like yeah yeah that's funny the i have a similar story so no, i have enough with the track bike is i never i had one for like a long time and I never I'd never seen someone skid I just knew that they could uh -huh. do it and I just didn't understand and then the first time I saw it I was like oh okay like now I get it but when you don't know what it looks like it's like how the fuck like what is this like what yeah like you don't want to throw yourself way over the bars if you don't like your brain thinks like oh you're just gonna fall over it <laughs> oh I'm pretty sure I fell I'm pretty oh, sure yeah. I fell I mean, that's the, sure. yeah, the first time I tried clipless pedals was the first time I rode a track bike and talk about falling. <laughs> yeah, that wow. shit fucking, I don't know, I'm fucking, I don't know, no excuses. <laughs> um, I, uh, so you're like a, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, Alonzo is a big photographer. It's like a huge part of your life, I would say. And I'm just kind of curious of yeah. like how you would say your your relationship to photography is. Wow, um, it's just an extension of art, to be honest. I was kind of thinking about this the other day, and um, someone asked me, "Is like how'd you get started?" I was like, "Man, I really just got started just loving art, and that was a, a medium that like I could easily kind of get to faster than kind of painting and learning how that learning that process." 
or like mixed media or even videos, you know what I mean? Like it's all art to me and I kind of yeah. keep it in one space. So for a long time, I didn't really call myself a photographer. I really wasn't down for that, especially like in LA where you kind of shoot the models in order to become like a photographer or do like some cool street art where you're taking pictures of bums and stuff. I just really wasn't into that. And mm. I did a, uh, like a lot of photography uh, with clay footwear for a long time. Yeah. So it's a little bit commercial and fashion and men's wear. So I did that for almost close to seven years. And I did the 35 millimeter like exploration on the side, which kind of bonded more track bikes, just hanging out with friends, traveling all around the world, you know, Puerto Rico and Barcelona and San Francisco, just, having a couple rolls of film and just wanting to have a place to show it and put it up, you know? So that's how some of that started. Um, I just kind of keep learning. I'm still learning, you know what I mean? Like I'm always keep learning. So I keep it open and I kind of steer away from uh, the photographer a little bit. I'm still embracing it a lot and I need to own it a, a bit more, especially as a freelancer, but I'm always kind of pushing a little bit more in terms of like design or social media rollout. And I do get a lot of work for that too. Um, but I, at the end of the day, I would love for people to just be like, Oh, he's an artist. That way I never really felt like I was just being kind of crammed into a box of a photographer and no one would ever think of me as a designer or like, you know, a marketing guy or, you know, or a yeah. graphic designer for that matter. Like labels are really are tricky because sometimes they're really scary to do, I've noticed. And sometimes they're kind of like the artist one, just being like even calling yourself as an artist is like can be really hard to do. So it's it's yeah. just interesting, like labels, you know, it's it's like do you, just because we say we're one thing, does that mean we start to identify with it? And then it almost like boxes it in. But at the same time, it could yeah. also be like like uh celebrating this thing you know like yeah but i you know i think of you as someone who uses photography you know like i get i think of all my friends as artists actually and a lot of them don't think the same way totally. you're one of the few that's like yo we're just like making shit like it doesn't yeah i like to make shit <laughs> yeah it's like just because you use one medium a little bit more than another doesn't mean that you're just that thing like None of us are just one thing. Even when yeah. we're focused, it's still like, you know, we're like dynamic beings. So there's all these like influence and different stuff. And then I, I also yeah. think that a lot of like artists like like yourself mm -hmm. and myself, it's hard to keep our attention for too long. So it's kind of like it does get to be like <laughs> yeah. all these things. I, I'm pretty sure I have ADHD. I got to like the advanced stages of it for sure. But I like I like to keep that feeling open so I could explore it more. You know, getting doing a lot of film with like the concept team and seeing the response, it makes me kind of come out of my shell a little bit and be like, yeah, I could produce a, I guess another film since I've done so many with the with the help of like Cesar Alvarez and, and Bobby Endo and like us coming together and doing it. You know, like when I see the response, I'm like, shit, I guess I am. But like, it takes me a little bit of time to incubate that, that stuff in me to say that I'm going to be that. I just kind of now gotten to the point where I just kind of live under the artist and hopefully people can kind of go to my website and see the things that I've done and be like, oh, I want to hire him for that. And I think it's become more of a hiring thing that made me have to kind of stand out as a photographer because that's what always kind of freelance available in the cycling industry you know what i mean like no one's going to bring you on for three months and be like we just want you to market this and then we'll pay you handsomely and then you leave doesn't happen i wish it did i really do this <laughs> do you do you make much uh like like personal work or work that's not for commercial use do you have a practice uh, in making any? things like that do you have do you have like a uh, do you make art that's not for commercial use? That's just like personal. I call it personal work. I don't know. Oh, oh yeah, of course. I like I study camouflage on the side. Um, oh, I have got you... like the big it's camouflage encyclopedia, the DPM book. I have Dude, it. I have it right there on my desk. And so I, good. I draw on my desk all the time. You mind if I go grab it? Yeah, please. If you want to see it, sure. I'd love to. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So I'm like always reading this big chunky thing that like literally has everything camouflage in life. It's probably like a seven to twelve hundred dollar book, pretty expensive. It's a two piece thingy. But it spawns me to kinda like draw these type of things. Yes. <laughs> so like camouflage and like wild kind of things all the time. Uh oh, sick. yeah, so they're all personal work. They don't like go anywhere and they just kinda like live in my room or like the people that I've given them to. Uh, and then yeah. And I usually do them on oversized cardboard and other camouflages and stuff like that. I'm like way into that. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it it looks like it's um it kind of reminds me of the commotion stuff that I do like it's kind of yeah so making work especially like that kind of work is it's uh-huh. kind of about like there's like this it's sort of like getting into this I guess you can it's say a rhythm. It's, it's tapping into flow but there's it, I, I don't exactly know what I'm trying to say with this it, it's visually evident when that happens commotion mm-hmm. the patterns that you're drawing like there's this like it's like a visual representation of flow so it's cool to yeah. it's it's kind of like this i feel like often maybe this is similar for you it's like chasing that feeling that state of mind the flow state it's like that's the dragon mm-hmm. that i'm always chasing like i want to get in that and just like vibe on it and then when you're in yeah. that space mentally you're yeah for us, we're making a visual thing. So it's almost like the wake or the result of that experience is this visual mm-hmm. work. So it's almost. Yeah. And it, well, I'm going to say that like it always comes out different. It's kind of like a, mm. just a emptying out feelings a little bit for me. It's like, a, especially when I'm doing these curvatures and I'm just being still and taking my time and, filling out the curves and like what's going to go next. And like, I don't think about those next. I just kind of get there and start it again. And then I get there and I start it again. And it kind of, I look at it as one circle sometimes. And then it has all these other lines that are like within it. Um, it's a take on the uh, Korean duck camo, but it has curvatures that kind of gives it a, a sub, 2d or 3d kind of angle on it Mm -hmm. so it kind of looks like uh skin cells on under a microscope if you kind of ever like looked at them a little bit kind of has that vibe to it depending on how i draw it or how large i draw it it could look like a cut you know or it could like look like skin over or something like that kind of looks different every time i play with it because what i'll do is i'll scan it and put it in illustrator and be an illustrator for like two hours after i spent two hours drawing that it's kind of wild so i go to different places with that medium have you ever used like apple pencil like a tablet i'm not that cool no not that cool i feel like it would work for you i mean you have expensive cameras like why would you not have some crazy (laughs) but whatever it's it's just like a it's like a it's basically what those two things that you just described merged into one. And I don't think it's a match for everybody. Actually, personally, I don't enjoy it. I really prefer analog, but for like, yeah. if you're already bringing it into illustrator, it can be like very less time intensive. See, I always think about it as the experience of producing the thing. Like, I like the, mm-hmm. the the visceral experience of like drawing or using a brush, specifically a brush, like how it feels. But I don't, uh-huh. and I don't enjoy the feeling of being on in like Illustrator and in like clicking points. Like it's a very different experience. You can be making yeah. art, but it's like it's accessing different parts of your mind. Yeah. So uh, yeah. But the pencil's like kind of a halfway between the two, you know, like if you if you if you're inclined to bring it in Illustrator, which it sounds like you are, because you can then you can build into a repeat and make like prints with it. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. You might dig it. It's also so smooth because it's it's plastic Mm. on glass, like the smoothest, most buttery is perfect because, you know, um, whatever medium you're using like that look cardboard mm-hmm. so there's like you know that's going to affect the ripple, line yeah. yeah or if it was just like smooth paper that's going to have like a different kind of a tooth to it or a pole uh, yeah i digress 
<laughs> um, sorry about that. Do, have you ever made uh, pa textile patterns out of those things, like repeats? Not, a, not out of that. That's just like private stuff. Like I was just elaborating on that. I just figured I'd show you to you. Um, it's just something that I do just to kind of like really mellow out. Sometimes I do it like late at night when I'm like kind of closing down. I kind of turn the computer off and turn on the nightlight and just go at it for a couple hours and I sleep usually the best. And usually if I'm able to get to that point, I'm having like, you know, like a great day at the end of the day. That's super. Okay. Uh, music or no music? Oh, music for sure. Yeah, yeah. Definitely with music on. Yeah. Sorry. Should have mentioned that. Okay. So what about, what if thought experiment making that a practice that you do every day at the end of the day? And you're saying a couple hours. That's a, that's, that's a long fucking time. Yeah. I'm like a, like a little night owl. Like I think I went to sleep last night at like 3 a.m. It's just quieter. Let's put on headphones so I don't disturb roommates and just kind of like go in on it. So it's either retouching or Lightroom or kind of like drawing just to kind of like, it's like my free day. I don't watch a lot of TV. Sometimes I find a show and then like I binge watch it and it's like yeah. over. I'm like, I ain't got nothing else to watch. So Yeah. I'm really curious about how you interact with this free making, this like personal work. It's not something that you, you don't have it on like a regiment, huh? Like, what if you did? What if you did it, like, every night? Like, that's, like, how you go to bed. I would just have a lot more cardboard boxes around the, the office and whole house. So, so, that's pretty much it. And it's You know, it's just, like, one of my things. It's personal. Like, I, I kind of, like, really like it for myself as I, like, yeah. continue to read the book. And they're, like, they're never all the same. Sometimes I mix in. I just draw a camo that I'm looking at. So, they're never really the same. There's the personal ones that I showed you. But I'll draw, like, a like a like a american woodland camo just just because i don't know <laughs> yeah just to because you know just to see the stroke lines as they before they get filled just a process that i like to go on have you Some people like hiking yeah <laughs> i like camo though so I, we could go off on this one uh have, i bet we could <laughs> have you ever made a rep a textile re or I think it's just called a repeat, like a repeating pattern. So a camouflage is a repeating pattern. Yeah, I've, I've made them. I have them as files. I have like a couple files that like of stuff that I've made. Yes. Yeah. Building have patterns. Have I produced them and sold them? No, no. But I don't care about it. It's, you know, just the act of making. Okay. Producing a, a repeat is what I call it, is like a, it's like mm -hmm. a fucking, it's like half artistic and half like, my, like math equation you're like it's like a puzzle uh -huh. to like visually unlock it's fucking it's it can be awesome and like the worst thing in the world it's a trick yeah that same process i use uh like the kaleidoscoping or that's the, what i call it yeah i have artwork that i've uh so to like a uh, I forgot the name of the hotel that used it, but under my website, there's something, you know, called art and there's some art stuff that I did up there that kind of like just lives there just to show the versatility. Uh, that's kind of the process that I use to make some of the uh, camouflage patterns sometimes, uh, just the kaleidoscoping of like a picture and stacking them on each other. Do they kind of repeat? Yo, those... So those kaleidoscopes as a repeating pattern would be fucking sick as like a t dude because it almost has like a quilt vibe to it yeah have you made any of those i want to see that i want to wear that <laughs> no i haven't dude. no I'm i haven't saying. uh oh what are you writing these days i am writing the Cervelo espero yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Tell me With, about uh, the Cervelo yeah, thing. Right. Hey, yeah, they came. Uh, we got into a place with uh, the team where it just needed a lot of reconstruction after the departure of um, Justin. Um, it was kind of like a little less hanging, and I was still kind of in Salt Lake City. And when I once I kind of got back, we just kind of had a couple meetings and decided like where we wanted to go with everything. And Bobby kind of like refreshed his energy on trying to like make this idea kind of 
continue to happen. And uh, we were still supported by uh, Seth Cannondale at the time. Uh, but I think we just reached a point where we wanted to kind of grow a little bit faster than they attended for us to. And we seek some other opportunities and a couple came up and we found like a good home at the end of the day with Cervello back uh, at the end of the year last year. And they've been like really supportive about like, you know, getting us on these bikes and getting us to reach some of the goals that we had. And they've been really adamant about doing that. Yeah. And supporting us with it. And the Sparrow is like one of the, I hate to say it, like it's one of the best bikes I've ever ridden, especially for a gravel bike. I've had a couple. Well, I had a lot of cyclocross bikes that like I rode gravel, which I probably should have never been riding some of this stuff on these types of bikes. I think I've had like the Swiss Cross, which had rain true to one of my favorite bikes at the time that Richie makes. Sick. And then I've had like uh, the, the Crux or or uh, I've also had like the All City, uh, was it Macho King or something like that? Yeah, but. And then uh, the Super X by uh, Cannondale, which was a great cyclocross bike. Just not my speed for gravel. It's a little too light and too... I felt like I would always break it for some of the stuff we were doing. But this Cervelo just took to the trails that made me have so much more confidence. And I'm riding a, Sick. Uh, 40s on it, so I'm like oh. ripping stuff up. Like so much confidence. I'm like, who is this guy? Yeah. Sick. Yeah. How big can you get the tires on that thing? I'm not sure, but I think the, you can get almost like a 44, maybe 42 to be safe. But I'm riding 40s and I look at it and there's a lot of room. It also doubles as like my current road bike until Sick. another one shows up that's being like customized. And I pop on some slicks. I'm currently riding like some Dore C35, I believe. Oh, yeah. sick. God, I should know what I'm riding. Um, with some slick 25s, and it handles like a freaking road bike. It's ridiculous. You have two yeah. different wheels. Even sets. like the swap out. Yeah, yeah two different wheel sets. Yeah. I mean, Pretty that's nice. that's the move right now, I think, with the is the kind of like the gravel bike really is this good kind of both bikes Be, if you have the extra wheel set. If you have the extra wheel set, you, yeah. So yours is GRX. Is it one by or two by? Two by. Yeah, yeah. See, that's where it would make it a lot easier to be a road bike then. For some, I don't really know why. It just feels traditional or something. Huh. It's good to have it there. Drop it down, some climbing, some <laughs> steep stuff. You know, like I love it. Yeah, but I've, I've ridden one by. It's not all the hype. If you're riding, if you're racing cyclocross, I can see how that makes sense. Especially in the criterium, I see how that makes sense. Outside of those, I don't really see how much it makes sense. Yeah. It's also very helpful if you're riding a lot of rugged terrain. Because it's just like, all you have to think about is this side, or whatever. There's digital is both, but you only have to think about one thing. So like, chain alignment, when you're like, you know what I mean? There's just too much happening. You can like, drop a chain or whatever. Yeah. I wish I knew all the details about the GRX that I was riding, but it it works. Can I say yeah. that again? It just works. And the texture <laughs> on the on the brake, on the grapes, yeah, on the brakes, on the hoods, rather, yeah. I like they feel good. I like the texture there. Uh, my hands get sweaty sometimes, and like I oh, sort yeah. of feel like I'm gonna just to kind of slip off. But it's like a lot of good real estate up there that you could just like get on there and hold it and feel good yeah did you know that with the grx you can have it change the pages of your garmin or your wahoo like boop boop you know to get to di the different pages or the data fields on your computer do you ride with a computer i did not know that oh i do okay i don't know you didn't tr you don't train either <laughs> I mean, I, I I do just to see like how long, how fast, and like uh, you know, like heart rate map. That's what I would gauge like my racing off of is like how many times I can get to that like threshold, like my heart rate. It's like yo, once I get to like one ninety two, like I got one more of those. Yeah, it's like, I ain't coming back from that one. How many times can you go to one ninety two? Like three? Uh, two. <laughs> two That's times. tight. Damn, I never thought about that. At the time. <laughs> That's like a way to test your 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 tank, basically. 
I mean, yeah, that's what I would always kind of like look at. At the time, like getting a power meter was like a thousand dollars. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I'd just be trying to like. Yeah, especially when heart rate. I mean, it, it works pretty much the same from what I understand. Is it? Ah, yeah, <laughs> I don't know either. Maybe it does it. Okay. We're in the same boat here. Fuck it. I, I, I like the idea, though, of like, I kind of have never really ridden with a heart rate monitor because I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. Like, I was like, okay, mm. it's just like around this number all the time. Like. But it's more for when you kind of like blow up then to see where your ceiling is. Yeah. And then you're kind of yeah. watching to see if you get to that number like too often or for too long, I would think. For too long, yeah, yeah. Sometimes for too long. So then I guess what I want to ask is how do you know how long you have? But you probably just got to do it. Well, I would, I would like look at the number and be like, oh, man, you know, 188. Like I need to like either figure out how to like chill out, spin a little bit more, you know, like I would try to figure it out on the bike. And I would like go into like a, whether a softer gear or just kind of like get out, you know, figure it out. Hmm. That's the way I wouldn't like blow up. Cause the last thing you want to do is just be kind of like shredding with all these people. And then like you blow up and like they're expecting you to keep pedaling. And then they try to go around you and another guy, you know, just does all this stuff. And I just like always figured like if I watch my heart rate, and I make sure like that's intact. Like I don't, you know, I'll make sure that like I won't cause anyone to like run into my rear wheel and cross wheels and catch some fields, crash, no one all that. No, no, no. We got... <laughs> yeah. are you, Definitely are... have my share of crashes too. Oh really? That's not cool. Yeah. I mean, I got less less of them in the last couple of years, but when I was racing, I mean, it was just kind of like any given Sunday. Fuck that. Yeah, That's like, your fault or usually nine times out of ten it's just not your fault and you're just caught up in it. And that, was it a lot of crits? A lot of crit races, yeah. Some road races. I didn't do too many of them. Mm. Like a lot of crit races. It was that at one point, I think, like some of the six-year races that I was doing were safer than the criterion. Oh, whoa. No, crazy. Yeah. Because people respected each other, you know, like, yeah, I know you don't have no breaks. And, like, kind of, they kind of already knew who you were, especially, like, being around so long. Like, they just expected you to be there, expected you mm. to ride the same line as everyone and not do anything kind of super dumb and sketchy. If you did, you'd get called out. And in, in fixed gear, you might have to catch a fade. You know what I'm saying? How? Road racing, not so much. Right. Right, right. Different cultures. Different cultures. Same Dude, I can only imagine the fun, the the rush of moving through like like Red Hook with the pack. Yeah, can you, do you could you get that moment of just panic? You're like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Don't start thinking about that. Just just keep riding bikes right now. <laughs> if you got to that point and Red Hook is all over, that's it's real. Over. That it's makes so sense. over, dude. Okay. Yeah. True. True. I had my share of them. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. 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 Fuck. Um, are you? Will you? Are you like? I know right now nothing's normal, but like, are you racing right now? Like when th if things ever go back to normal? <laughs> no. So you're oh, done. if things went back to normal, I am always willing to pop in. You know, my category race and kind of like just be in there. Yeah. So, yes. Oh, sick. So, you like, know, if I get beat a lot or someone talks some shit to me and, and inspires me and lights me on fire and I might start training and doing intervals and going to all the fast guy rides, I might do it. You know, earlier this year, I did the coast ride, but I didn't do it with the actual pro group that left San Francisco. I kind of like left Oakland down. Oh, cool. Uh, Sean Martin rode with me uh, some of the ways, I think just past Morgan Hill and then I Same. made my way down to uh, uh, Monterey yeah. and just rode down in prep of like I think I might race this year let's see how I feel oh. after these four days and I get back to LA That's and smart. it's like yeah then COVID like literally happened like two weeks after that you know as my body starting to heal after riding like a hundred and some odd miles a day for like four days of right. like 
all right, I think I can like ride anything over 40 miles now. Oh, for and then sure. It's like, no, no. Yeah, like, no. Dude, straight Probably lockdown. Lockdown. Yeah. You're like, what? I'm just going to fucking like just watch this fitness fade away. No, evaporate from your body. <laughs> you gone, like, Jesus. Get back Jesus. down here. I need no. you. Clapped uh, out. Do you think do you, you consider yourself like a competitive person? You ever think about that? Competitive person, Alonzo. Um, I think I'm like secretly competitive in terms of uh, like like what it is. I don't like kind of like let the emotion like pour out. I kind of like, oh man, like I want to have a team. Like I want to win. So I will go and build a team or build something that will help me like get to that, to get to that point. You know what I mean? Like even in, in terms of like work now, it's like, man, I have to build relationships in order to actually like continue to achieve something. So I barely like get too competitive. I just like use that energy to like make myself better whenever I feel that way or whenever the hater rate, when the hater rate comes on, I'm just like, Ooh, they did something cool. I want to work on this. And I like leave that silent. Don't comment and just go work on it. Yeah. 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 I mean, so yeah. And I wasn't even just saying specifically with cycling competitive is just like, some people are just like always, I don't, I mean, I guess I somewhat understand, but you know, some people are crazy about it. So it's in every facet of their lives. Yeah, I just didn't want to leave you hanging, like, in terms of, like, oh, I'm not competitive. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah I, don't, I think everyone's naturally competitive. I just I, wanted I, to yeah. express, like, how I am competitive. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Or how, what you do with that energy, basically. Energy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, I like that one. Because it's, it's like, um, the energy you get from, or, it's, I mean, I guess energy and emotions are kind of tied into a, I would almost say, emotions are what translates energy so it comes in through mm-hmm. one and then the emotion is how we can kind of understand it in in one yeah. regard at least yeah like how you i like um okay so say if it's like like the haters like say you get like a negative thing thrown at you how do you uh-huh. <laughs> transform that energy or what do you do with that energy like i said like i I hear what's said, you know, I kind of like break them down so that they like are not so raw because most people could just give out raw emotions or raw energy. Yeah. And I kind of like look at it and say like, why they say that? You know what I mean? I'm very good at kind of telling like when someone's on your team or just trying to like tear you down and some people don't know they're doing it because they're not aware of that when they have that emotion that that, that spawns a certain energy that has an action. So I kind of just, I just sit back, man. You know, I kind of sit back and I say, why they do that? And I kind of like look at it from their angle and kind of like bring myself to the center without like kind of being reactionary. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. How, how do you not do react? Like, is it, are you just thinking, like kind of analyzing it a little bit more? And like, yeah, I just take my time with it. Mm, that's I take my yeah. time with it and cool. I just kind of like dissect it or huh. I will send it to someone that I trust and be like yo what do you think of this and he'll be like oh yeah you fucked up I'll be like fucked up and I'll take that Yeah, I'll own it I'll, and I'll be like yeah I fucked up I shouldn't have done that or I should have done this hmm yeah I like this yeah it's kind of it's kind of weird to like I, I hold myself accountable I am my worst critic it's why I probably don't produce, you know, like my art because I wouldn't want anyone to attack that. So I'm hiding it from people, oh, but I just showed everyone. So. That's a good observation. You're like protecting it. It's like the, the, uh, you can't fail if you don't try. Like you're not going to lose if you don't enter. Like, there you go. Yeah, that's a, that's part of it for sure. So that's interesting. You feel like there's, um, like it's a vulnerability maybe with that, with the personal work. No, but no. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I don't like really being that vulnerable. You know what I mean? I don't like really putting myself out there like that. No, I don't. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question of, uh, I feel like it's, it's interesting to do things that are uncomfortable. And as cyclists, we're kind of always <laughs> doing things that are uncomfortable. 
But I think that in yeah. those uncomfortable things, that's where growth comes from. It's uh, summed up as mm-hmm. simply as no pain, no gain. Like, so, yeah, having a relationship to, dis- to discomfort, I don't know. It's just a different perspective. It's not that we always have to be in that zone or that mode, but mm. I think there's like, there's value in it, you know, like even just to, to have the opportunity to see something in our lives. That's like, Oh, I, it would, I feel vulnerable around that. I think that is, there's like a value in that. Cause you can kind of know like, Oh, my mm. edge is like right there. Like, I don't necessarily have to do anything with that, but I just kind of know where that is. And like, what happens if you just kind of like push on a little bit, push on a little bit. Yeah. You could almost, this might be the wrong word, anthropologically see if there are results from, <laughs> um, <laughs> testing discomfort. I might've just rambled myself yeah. into a, oh. I did. It earlier. I do it all the time. It's gonna, we're going to call this the uh, rambling episode. <laughs> it's, it's, I think it's therapeutic to get the thoughts out and then you hear it back and you're like, okay, I need to clarify my own meaning sometimes or like how I communicate to people. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to listen to this and be like, I need to be a little bit more direct in what I say. <laughs> you I'm okay with it. totally summed up my experience with a lot of these podcasts. Or even just the videos. I need to just say shit simply and I'll take all this bullshit to just say this thing. That's, you're very, uh, yeah, you're like my conscience. Tell me what else, what else do I need to do in life? (laughs) More wisdom, sir. (laughs) Um, I I don't don't know, man. I'm sorry. Uh, You can help arrest the killers of Brianna Taylor. And yeah, absolutely. It's for conscience speaking. It's what? Would you say? For conscience speaking. Oh yeah. Yeah. What's the? <laughs> what do you think the best way to do that for people is? Keep talking. Keep having the conversation. You know, we're gonna have to make some type of change. No, not policies are not okay. You know what I mean? I first heard about those type of policies through music, through Gil Scott Heron, you know, and like hearing it and feeling it now. Yeah, man, it's uh, you think you'd be farther along, especially when you're having like numbers like 2020 and we have all this stuff, you know, around where there's like a Tesla and computers and iPads and information everywhere that, we would be able to see laws and say, we need to do something about that Yeah, immediately. Right. You know, so that it doesn't happen before, but we definitely need to rectify what happened. Absolutely. But we are, you know, kind of not doing that. Slowly be surely, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's like such a big, so to me, how I see that is like, that's like a bigger thing than a lot of individual people. Like what's a way that mm-hmm. how we can affect change in our lives, right? Like I think that is kind mm-hmm. of like a, a powerful, very actionable way instead of like, oh, the, the things mm-hmm. over there and this, it, a lot of that gets, it feels very, you feel helpless often. Mm-hmm. And it seems that evoking change within your own mind to begin with, uh-huh. And how we interact well, yeah. with people and like, I mean, does that, it seems like that's the best we can do. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you've said making, you know, the change in your own life. And I think you have to look at what that life is. And if you say your life is um, artistry and cycling, start to make those changes within those communities. It's going to be the fastest activation you can possibly have is making the changes in those communities so that people within those communities know and love and respect you will hopefully have the heart and ears to hear what you're saying and it could travel amongst the community so our community safe and we have each other's back 
but just like everyone in cycling, as soon as you get off the bike, you might be a nurse, you might be an artist, you might be a police officer, you might be a government official. You get a chance to be in a community that hear that message authentically and everyone in around you are kind of singing the same hymn. So it kind of comes a little call and response when you're sharing stuff online or reading them or doing your own kind of, you know, activism by, you know, producing a team that is like multiracial, like making, you know, what the future is supposed to look like now. And that's what I'm trying to do with concept. It's just like, man, I'm taking a whole bunch of great dudes who come from many different backgrounds and love each other. We fucking love each other as well. And it's a real diverse team. <laughs> like, it doesn't, yeah, I've never really seen one outside of it. And we have a democratic team as well. Like, we don't, we vote on everything. You know what I mean? Where we're going, like when we go eat and so on and so forth. So we have a real, like, Sick. kind of brotherly love thing kind of going on. And, like, even during COVID, we would just text each other, like, oh, this is lame, but, like, oh, let's do a video call. And we'd be like, oh, my God, we've been on a Zoom call for four hours. I'm drunk. You high. Like, we've been laughing. Like, this feels good. Still having that connection and feeling good. Yeah. So doing those in your community, uh, I think, is uh, the fastest way you could see change. Yeah, I love it. Sorry, I rambled. Oh, it's a, that was a good ramble. Maybe that's a, a good... Uh... Ender? I, sometimes I get really confused about, so I recently read this book called Me and White Supremacy, and it showed like all this crazy shit about white privilege in America and how white people deal with it, and of course like all the systematic oppression that happens to black people in America, and it's, mm -hmm. it's this crazy thing, and it was great for me because it really opened my eyes up to the privilege that I have. I had no idea. There's a, a famous quote that uh, privilege is when a problem doesn't affect you. You, oh, mm -hmm. I'll say that one. When you don't- Take your time, baby, take your time. <laughs> that feels, um, yeah. I just spun no, no, out. No, I wanted the definition. I'll look uh, it up. Okay, um, privilege is when something isn't a problem to you, you don't think that it's a problem. Or when something that wow. doesn't affect you, you don't think it's a problem. I, it's, I'm not saying that quite exactly right, but I think you get the gist. So I do, I do. So my, like, I didn't grow up with like systematic oppression. I didn't grow up with like all of my ancestors being like slaves and beaten and tortured and like all the most horrific things of existence. And it, it's really opened my eyes to that, which is like, it has been, it's so loaded with all these different emotions and like, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to say, you can't, you know what I mean? Like, but I also think kind of like the discomfort thing is just starting and just trying to say something, say it wrong and be like apologetic. Like, I'm sorry, I don't know how I'm supposed to say it. I'm learning through this. And I don't know, like, so that I think is the point is that I often won't know what to say because it's like crippling because you're afraid to say something wrong because it's, I feel like how, like I didn't live through that. So I'm not, I don't have like the right, it's not my thing to, it's not. Hmm. What do you think about all this? Hmm. Um, it is your thing to kind of get rid of. You're an American, so you should want to get rid of racism and bigotry and laws that kind of, uh, you know, prevent people from living the American dream, correct? Isn't or it your job to help get rid of that? Yeah. But I think that's humanity's job for humanity. Like, nobody should go through yeah. that. Like, everyone of course, should be on board with that. But of course, people aren't. For a lot of weird and fucked yeah. up reasons. But so going back to what I said about like 
activating yourself in your community. Mm. When you have people around you that love and respect you and they know your intentions, that conversation is a lot easier. We're literally having it right now. I yeah. don't think this is that hard. We may not have the right words to articulate it at the perfect time, but I'm pretty sure when we walk away and when we look at it, we're going to say, wow, I did understand, or I might complete your sentence or you might have another thought that we might even just still have a conversation later, but it just kind of needs to start. You know what I mean? I think we had it in the past, but you know, America with its pro and tell pro and all those other things, it's systematic racism kind of put a block on that, put a block on, you know, uh, true American growth. And if you believe in that and you want it to go forward and you have to activate yourself, um, in that field and you might have to feel a bit guilty which hopefully creates the energy of compassion that will make you do something above and beyond like what you even expected to do you know i got like a lot of guys raising money that i never would have thought would have been like into that because i've just seen them as those guys and you know just like those white guys with that brand that makes the same color kid as everybody else but they're really doing good work and i'm like wow I'm happy I'm in that community. It shows me something. So I'm on the opposite side of you. But I feel really happy that, like, I'm in a community that is really taking it to task. It's not for cycling, almost America. There's a lot of great things happening in cycling, especially uh, up against what we're up against. But, you know, I feel safe and secure. And there's things that are happening that need to happen. You know what I mean? There's crazy threads all over the place. But when I go through the thread and I read all the nasty ones, there's a shit ton of good ones too. So it's kind of like 75, 20 and five people in the middle, maybe, maybe there's a lot more. I'm just trying to like big up the cycling industry a little bit or the cycling community rather. I'm not really one for down at pointing fingers. You know what I mean? It's not my jam. No, that I'd rather be like, yeah. hey, you should you should think about doing it this way. And I mean, I was one of those, you know, black cyclists that got the call. What could we do? How could we do it? You know what I mean? We'd love to work with you. Could you write us something? Could you do that? I was like, um, no, it's something. You know, I was also on the side of how come you're not posting and how come Indo didn't post and or how come it is like we've been like here the whole time being people of color. Uh, we still have to live here through it all. You know what I mean? While we're making the change with ourselves, with our livelihood too. You know what I mean? Yeah. I because mean, if there's no team, if there's no biracial teams or black teams around and need the energy and have it actually going for itself, brands are not going to have anything to kind of help them in that process. I feel like, you know? So there needs to be, like I said, representation matters. There needs to be like a welcoming kind of situation and a uh, even a visual situation to see Legion and to see Justin. If I was like 14, I'd be like sick. I think that actually what Rasan Pahadi was for me. was like, man, that's tight. I, th- I think I could race. Sick. I mean, actually, yeah, that happened. That actually happened to me. You know what I mean? Like, so that happened. And now, even though I wasn't going to be like, continental pro i still became really valuable to the cycling industry or community to some degree by continuing and initiating teams and like having them kind of just be available to be viewed and like happening it's so hard to run these things they're they take a lot of work Mm -hmm. you know what i mean but someone has to kind of like do the work Mm -hmm. yeah how do you feel about the so like brands showing BIPOC in marketing, like I feel like I just heard you say both sides of it is like, it's good to see that, but also at the same time, it's a little bit of like, like there's feels like there's a certain amount of in, ingenuity, ungenuineness, ungenuity. <laughs> it feels like artificial. Like they're like, oh, we've got ingenuine? to like, ingenuine. Yeah. they're trying to be like, we need to have like, one BIPOC and one woman and a, you know, like all the things. And I guess like, well, where's the line of like, if it's not genuine, it's just like, but maybe is it, do you, how do you feel about that? Um, I 
truly, truly believe that if you want to make that type of change, you have to kind of consult with said parties, even if they're not in your sponsor group or not your pro athlete, if you can. And, and for another thing, like, there shouldn't be, like, a lot of men running women's programs. You should ask women how they feel and what they need. You should never really ask a guy. Agreed. Put the people that you want to see or your, you know, your mission statement or your, you know, your marketing objective. You should have, you know, that person or someone who's been in that community of people be in the driver's seat of that. Mm-hmm. Now, and that, as I say that, I think uh, one of the guys at Specialize, his name is Colin. Um, he's an African-American man and he was in a position to have someone uh, photograph Justin Williams for a new tarmac. And he got another word from another guy. And Justin said, I know him. And like, it kind of came back to me and I was like, I'm kind of into it. And then we made it happen within a week and it became great. Like, well freaking done. Kudos to Specialize. Next, it's not just Specialize. It's next, who else got it? You know what I mean? What is Cannondale going to do? What is Rally going to do? What is Santa Cruz going to do? Are you? Do you want to do anything if you don't? Don't get called out. Don't go running for trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's a great example of when it totally comes together. Yeah, I'm all about like making it come together. Like I don't really want to be like you didn't do that and they didn't have that. Like, fuck, like. Well, how are we going to change that? I'm all about, like, the actual change. I'm less about occupying something. I'm more about, like, infiltrating. Hmm. Yeah, how does that, uh, how do you visualize that? How does that... Meaning, like, I don't really care to just see black people or POCs in advertisement. Who works there? Who's leading this? And that's, those are the questions that I'm interested in because those are going to be the things that continue to change. The one photo shoot is just still one photo shoot that you pay the guy three at $400 max for like one or two days to represent like this hundred thousand, maybe million dollar baby product. It's just kind of bandwagging like my identity for exactly. product. Kind of, kind of shitty, don't you think? 100%. Um, but putting together a campaign that like really makes sure that everyone's included all the time and having people be accountable for that, you know, by putting the right people in the driver's seat or in these positions, you can't lose with that. You know, at least you did the right thing in order to try to get there. You know what I mean? So when you're occupying, you're just occupying space in the photo but when you're info trading you're in the brand like the same thing i was telling you about also like i had to go in and look at all the things they've done with all these racy ads and half-naked women and say nope and matter of fact like in your new houdini i'm thinking we should sh- shoot it on a socal sprinter and he's black with tattoos and it was a good campaign and the photos turned out great and i hired a uh, uh, um, a Latino guy under uh, Cesar Alvarez to shoot it, and it was great, and it, it did really well, and I was happy. It was, I had a lot of championing moments over there, even though people were just like, "What are you trying to do?" Like, okay, like a black dude shoot a mountain bike in Moab, like it's okay. That's sick. It's more info trading. So I, Rebecca was going to be there. You know what I mean? Like real writers were going to be there. Rebecca Rush, meaning like a woman, had to be there. Like we need to have one. And I tried to get another one, and it was just like timing. It's like, no, I need to have that because I know what it's not. I know what it feels like not to be in it. So I'm doing everything that I can while I'm in the driver's seat to make sure that that does not happen. That's sick. Yeah. So when you put people like that in the driver's seat, you're kind of assuring for the win. Yeah. Yeah, it's great on so many levels, too. Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like 
it sounds like what you were doing at Asos was like fighting the good fight. I suppose you can only like you can only do you can only do that for so long. That's not the right way to ask that. It's like it was overwhelm I don't know. It was overwhelming, right? From what I gather. Yeah. Like no support, overworked. But you were making change in like a really of course. Yeah, yeah. strong way. Cool yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and a team um, in Salt Lake City were really adamant about that stuff, yeah. So I guess I kind of like, why not keep fighting that fight? Like, why, why wouldn't you just stay there and just, is it just too exhausting? Um, I mean, also winter. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, uh, that, that's one of them for sure. Um, I need culture in order to be creative. I have to 100%. see what shoes people are wearing, how they're wearing it, the, the studded belts, why they're wearing studded belts. Um, head bandanas, um, Crocs, Birkenstocks, Vans, Jordans. I like, I want to see all the t-shirts. And when I go, one of my favorite things about coming to LA is like the airport. You just see everyone, Same. all the stuff. And I love how diverse like Los Angeles is. It's mm. gritty. It's clean. It's fabulous. It's, it's yeah. hip. It's funky. It's dirty. It's rad. It has road, road riding. Uh, there's there's mountain lions like two miles from my house in Griffith Park like I needed all that and I didn't have that there and the culture here is so robust and cycling and so tight-knit that over time after just going to campaign to campaign like once a week and kind of figuring out how to design a cool social media campaign like two big ones and two small ones and Wow. trying to create assets and shoot and design them and then write copy for something I kind of never really got a chance to use. And I really wasn't in on the product. And when I did the product review, it's just kind of like, this is what it is. This is all we made it. No room for negotiations. Bye. Right. I was creatively drained. Yeah. And when I came back from tour of California, um, like my computer crashed. Like I knew I had like some images and stuff like that. I had did the job. It had went well. And I just, Damn. I stayed in LA, I think for like two extra days and like, when I, like didn't go back to work because I was just <laughs> so beat being on the road. And one of my closest friends, Kyle Kelly, who owns Golden Saddle, I had got married. So I flew in from Switzerland Whoa. that Friday, flew out the next day, went to the wedding, got hammered, woke up at, 4.30 in the morning, went to LAX, flew to Sacramento for the start of Tour of California and was on the road um, for the next 10 days uh, with Kelly Samuelson of oh, La Sweat. Oh, she was yeah. working there too under uh, yeah. Right. She's That's cool. Sick. Yeah, she is cool. And I love for Kelly. Yeah, I get you on the culture. Fucking Utah to LA. It's like two sides of a coin right there. He's like, Oh, There's some cool people there though. Some cool people there for sure. But there, it, I, it sounds, I mean, I can understand. It's like not quite enough to like fill the well. You got to keep that uh-uh. shit. No. What comes out must go in. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. What comes out must go in. But I, like I said, I end up being like just creatively empty and drained. And, um, Coming back to LA, I was just like, oh man, like I don't even know. Um, I spent some time in uh, Atlanta for a little bit and then came back and like Sick. really got it going. Um, How'd you like Atlanta? Back here with the team. It was fun. It was hot during the summer. It gets so um, humid. It was just like, like it was like, I don't even need to buy lotion anymore because I was always sweating. Totally. It's just like so humid. It's cool. But their, their bike community is, is growing. Like it's, serious out there it reminds me like of the early days of you know traveling from LA to San Francisco for like quick city rumble and you're like oh all these people like it's just like it's 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 cool man and uh I have some good friends there uh Horace and Tara they uh run um Mob Atlanta 
and they're really good people. Um, we posted some events out there where they brought like myself, Masan, and Sean Martin down and hung out with the people, shared some of our experience. I did some of the races and uh, drink beer and, and look at the culture uh, from the inside of Atlanta that it was just growing. Yeah. You think they fuck with much off-road stuff there? I don't know the terrain in Atlanta. Yeah, there's a few guys. There's a few guys um, who are riding like gravel bikes and stuff. Yeah, there's still the road, your casual roadies out there, but they're I'm, I was everywhere. Specifically referencing like six gear riding or like no, no like that type of like let's city. go do you know some yeah some city stuff, see our city and get some beers after type of stuff. I grew up on that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I have a weird uh, duality in between, like, uh, people following me and, like, expecting, like, to always see, like, cool stuff coming out. Like, the people would be like, oh, when this kit coming out? Or, like, uh, when is you? When are you guys going to race? Or can I be on your team? Or could you send me a jersey? Or can I get a discount? So, I, like, always, I like that I get or I build a following. Because every now and then, I feel like I have something to say. I need to say it. And other times, I'm just like, let me just get on stories, holler at my team and the people that I like in, like, the primary portion of it, and then, like, kind of get off. I try to, like, get off a little bit. I like posting stories and stuff like that when I'm having a, a good day. But I try not to subscribe to the social media world of highlight living, mm. even though I partake in it. And I was, like, you know, like a social media manager for her. A bit. Oh, but that's different. That's for uh, a brand. A brand's experience. Yeah, it's is for a brand, different. and it's worse. It's worse. Sure. It's worse. Yeah, yeah, it's totally worse. But people would tell you all types of stuff. Right. Yeah, because it's not a person. It's like fucking. They'll throw anything at it. The, yeah, uh, they think that there's like, uh, like some automatic system of uh, like it's like impersonal when right. they're saying what they're saying. Like they'll say, "Oh, this is fucking dumb." <laughs> like, why would you make pink? Men don't make pink. And then you'll make, you, you'll suggest the company, why don't you make a black one? And then some older dude was like, no one's going to see you on the fucking road. This is asinine. Oh, shit. You, I mean, sometimes you just never win. You know what I mean? Or if it's a really great product and a really great campaign you poured a lot of energy into, someone will be like, this is shit. It's too expensive. Wait, is it too expensive or is it shit? <laughs> yeah, sure, because I'm pretty sure you. I didn't see you go to BMW.com or you know their their platform and be like, "Hey, this car is too expensive. It's shit." <laughs> I want to start doing that. Go on to all the like car things. Be like, "This is too expensive." <laughs> too expensive. It's shit. It's shit. <laughs> Wait, yeah, but- there's sometimes I go and people will say, "Yo, these bikes. We like your bikes, man. How's the ride?" I'm like, "Oh, yeah." freaking sick you know what i mean it's like yeah i wish i could afford one and i would go to their page and they have like all these sneakers and these like cool cars and trinkets i'm like <laughs> you could totally have it if you wanted it right like you, you gotta know. want that shit yeah yeah like i would see guys who were complaining about like uh like cycling kits but they have like a 380 dollar helmet on i'm like oh, wow. you wouldn't like buy like a winter jacket but you want to ride in a winter jacket and this winter jacket's only 300 bucks but you have a 370 dollar helmet on with a ten thousand dollar bike but you're complaining about a 300 dollar winter jacket yeah that type of stuff will draw make you insane i think i probably did go a little crazy <laughs> probably why i ramble a lot <laughs> do you uh what do you ever think about your feed as like a portfolio more than like a highlight of your it, life it does yeah. It does. It does. It does play as a portfolio. Most people say, oh, I've seen your work on your Instagram. And then I went to your site and I just I just knew you would. We wanted to work with you. Sick. Yeah. That happens a lot. I mean, it just it kind of happened earlier today. Oh, so sick. Like, oh cool, man. Yeah. 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 That's tight. Cool. So if you're a brand looking for a stellar creative outputter, look no further than Mr. Alonzo Tall. I didn't know that your last name was Talbert. Yeah. Why'd you say that? Talbert. I just shortened it. Why'd you say that? Talbert. I think it was like a, it was a, it was like a, a Google thing. Like when you signed up for, um, like, uh, Gmail and it gives you a suggestion. And I, oh. 2004, it like gave me Alonzo Tall and I just kind of 
I was like, okay, I'm gonna make my Tumblr that, my oh, Instagram and my oh, Facebook that, and all this smart. stuff that. And then it just kind of became that. Like that if you smart. type in Alonzo Tauber, only thing he's gonna type in is like you. USAC finishes, high school stuff, and maybe like some professional work that when you got to get printed. Other than that, like I'm probably just using a lot of the tiles as just shorter and it sounds cooler sometimes. No, it's good. I love it. I didn't know that you like branded your name. It's fucking cool. Unintentionally and then intentionally. Yeah, I mean, the idea has got to come from somewhere, you know? Like, but if, I am a marketing guy. What, what's that? I said, I am a marketing guy. Yeah, that's why you did that whole thing, even if you don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Cool. All right, player. Um, I, mean, I think I did have a question for you. Oh, um, yeah. I, I always was, like, curious about the early days of Cadence because mm. it was one of the beacons of me wanting to create stuff because I remember picking up one-off stuff in push bikes. Yeah. In San Francisco. Yep. Uh, Sarah Murder. Yep. Ran the store. And you would have one off there. And it would be like an inside out uh, top part for, I guess, for a brazen for like messenger bags with like a standard body with like a pocket here and an yeah. integrated mask. I was just like, that's fucking sick. Yeah. I remember one time Sean Martin hates me for this because you guys don't know this guy. He's a really cool dude. We were both looking at stuff. Uh, we were there for QCR, Quick City Rumble. And we're looking uh, in the shop and uh, everyone's outside drinking beers and barbecuing, getting ready for like uh, some alley cat. And he goes, ooh, this is sick. And I'm like, oh, let me check it out. And then someone got his attention. I like literally took it, went up there and paid for it. And then wore it the rest of the week. <laughs> It was so cold. It was so cold. It was like yeah. the like the summer or something. So I thought it would be like just as warm as SoCal at night. No, no, not Fucking at all. Freezing. I needed a I needed a, a, a like a jacket, and he was Shit. so pissed off. I think I had that thing for a long time, and it's probably still in storage. I have like sixty boxes of stuff that I just have of people that I got stuff of. Yeah. Damn, that's fucking awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, but I was, like I was saying, I was always curious, like, what are some of those, like, fondest, like, cadence moments? From the early days? Yeah. I mean... Only the early days. That's what's up. <laughs> you know. I'm joking. Um, the, I mean, really, like, cadence in those early days was, it was kind of my art, honestly. It was just, like, uh -huh. a way for me to make work work and the the brand was my art so i could put concepts into it it could be functional it all had to be stuff that i could produce through the things that i had access to so there was a ton of limitations in that and then that you mm. know will be where you can get really creative when you're like okay i only have like these four things like how can i what can i hap make happen out of those and yeah. so and it was so for the first seven years that i did it I did it as a one man band. So everything. And I, I actually like making work like this. Like I don't I'm not a team player. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just like oh, I like working by myself. Out. Oh, it's not a secret at all. I get like, it. I totally yeah. Do. I just like I like being by myself. It's like yeah. Uh so yeah, I just did all the things and it it kinda had a burnout factor too, because it was just like too much shit. And you're just like Yeah. Ugh. And then it shifted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those times were like, I really look back on them fondly because it was so cool to create this thing that wasn't my name, which was really helpful. It was Cadence, but it really was my, mm. me. And then I would give it concepts. So I would make conceptual collections every season. And then I would mm -hmm. have to produce all the pieces for those seasons. So there were collections. And... Just that whole formula is pretty, it's cool. It's pretty interesting. And I feel like often I'm slightly, excuse me, chasing the, like, tr I was on a good flow Early for a day. while. Just that flow, 
not like necessarily like what I made, like how I made things and the focus. Mm, the attention. Yeah. And I think a big part of that was when I started to do it for first time for the first time. No, I'm saying that wrong. When I started to, when I started to do it for a living for the first time, I felt mm. this tremendous amount of freedom because it was like, I can make whatever the fuck I want. And a big part of that too was a studio that I moved into and I like live and worked out of the same thing. It was a big cement rectangle. It was white and I could do anything I wanted in there. You want to dump a gallon of paint <laughs> on the ground? You can do it. Like everything. That's big. That's it big. was fucking sick. It was so freeing. It was like, whatever goes, it doesn't, and there's there's a lot of value to that. And that's similar to what you say with your personal work. It's like this free space to just make. Yeah. And it doesn't it doesn't matter if it's like it's not for a thing. So therefore it can't be wrong and it doesn't have any pressure to it. And I think mm -hmm. things that exist within those spaces are very important. Yeah, and almost like I almost feel like I'm always trying to set up those moments as much as possible to varying degrees mm. of success. What stops you from that? My mind, a hundred percent, my mind mm. pressure, expectation, thinking that it should be a certain what it's thinking. Absolutely. What it is start thinking mm. on a thing and it just like, zzz, and then it's just like, I should probably stop smoking weed altogether because that exacerbates it. Does that happen to you? Oh, I don't do that. Dude. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like I smoked before I came on this show. would probably, probably have to edit out the first parts of it. Oh, it's all, I mean, but do you find that weed will like speed you up? I mean, we could have smoked on the show too. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know that. That's okay. I guess I didn't, yeah. Next um, time. Exactly. But... Last question, um, and it's not even a question. I just, I think I'm just telling you online. Um, I'm doing this thing where I just kind of like want to pop up in cities. I definitely want to come to Portland and ride with you. Oh fuck yes, please! We'll make a video. That'll be awesome. That'd sick. be super sick. Yeah. But it's like, is this like after COVID? Or like, <laughs> will, will there ever be an after COVID theoretically? That's what I'm saying. But people are traveling now, too. It's like a really weird one. Yeah. Yeah, I've been traveling for assignments. So, um, oh, really? It's a, it's a bit tricky, but you just have to like kind of just keep your circle small, do all the things you need to do. That's sort of been my strategy when I have to go out. Other than that, I'm already naturally kind of a, a creative hermit, uh, so to say. If I roll this computer around, you're like, okay, he's in a studio. He's not... Just sitting on a couch. Give us a give us a peek. You tell I got we gotta see no, it. No, no. Cause you're no, shit is like, so they're... sterile behind you. It's like the look at how just like I live in a in a, a, a condo block with nothing on the walls. Yeah. <laughs> and I just meditate. Exactly. <laughs> Locking all the haters out. That sheet is also his only other piece of clothing. Uh doubles as a bed and uh, a bindle stiff, which is <laughs> no. There's like samples, boxes, fabric, and stuff I made, and books, and uh, yeah, three computers. Nah, I don't. Nah, nah. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's one of my things where I don't like to make a lot of clothing because I would hate to like get 200 t-shirts, sell 100, and then just have them sitting somewhere, or have to pay for storage and have to do it. So I try to make like marginally priced, like small items, like roll pouches or like kits and stuff like that, that are like not crazy and like in limited quantities and kind of keep moving on. And if you find it, you find it. Yeah. Do you sell them on, not like really on, your, into. on a website? Um, I am building a new website. It used to be more tracktype.com, but someone tried to, so the legal stuff and then the website was getting like a certain like amount of hits and I had to like upgrade my oh. broadband and then oh. there was time where like I was just 
working, like actually like really, really working, especially when I moved to Salt Lake City, I couldn't keep up with it. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a bunch of money, like going, going, going anywhere. And plus I wasn't shooting film and that, at least that much in Salt Lake City. So I just kind of like took it down and like ignored all the legal stuff that had to, to do with it with people trying to like copyright the name and then like fake stuff popping up overseas. It was just like over. But I have been working on a new agency with a couple other like partners um it's called cover and i've been just working on it slowly but diligently um there's like some social media guys marketing guys some other photographers and production stuff and rentals and so just kind of colliding all that stuff because i realized as a freelancer i was using all these people period and i people be like oh i want to work with you and him i'm like well i gotta get on a phone with him so i'd rather have somewhere where we could show all the work we did together or their individual work and kind of house it in one place. But more track bike now is going to be housed on there just to be housed. And we'll have like a, a market of some sort where if I do like some cool stuff with Chaz or do some cool stuff with Z wise with Kyle or Sean, or, you know, like I talked to, LA Bike Academy about hosting a class with some of the junior uh, kids oh. that they have riders and Shit. like getting them to like I'm trying to raise money or get enough money like on projects that I'm doing to like buy a bunch of disposable cameras go on a ride and a lunch and have them shoot and make them a zine that they could like Whoa, sell and cool. produce more money for their team and kind of show them partial of what composition is and like how to put something in frame or just how to be wild and free like, I used to do this thing where, like, I load the camera up with film and then, like, go like that and snap it and it produces this weird blur light with flash. It's kind of oh. weird. Yeah, or, like, put, like, little pieces of red, like, uh, gels in front of the thing and make it blur out, bleed red and stuff like that. And That's Some cool. stuff I used to do, but, yeah, just, like, giving that kind of, like, can't get everything off the internet you just have to kind of experience it and have someone explain it to you verbally and and show you physically and then once you have a tangible little item or i call it little creation machine or you know like a paintbrush to a disposable camera they're kind of one of the same but yeah. you create art you create art with it not just a picture or experience and teaching them that so just trying to do these like little things kind of sub covertly until I put it out and I need support from the community. I love that idea. That's fucking cool. I don't know how the hell we got to that. I was going to ask you something at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, fuck. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. What do you, you have less, do you have strong feelings about film versus digital for photography? No. No, no. And I, I kind of keep them a little separate. You know, most of the, I rarely take my digital camera out outside of work or oh, yeah. projects that kind of revolve around like the concept team or something that someone had asked me as a friend to do portrait rise or something like that. Mm -hmm. And like, if it wasn't for like my website, you we'd probably like never really see it. Like I have very minimal, like I just post bike stuff all the time, which I probably should get away from that, you know, but like posting a picture of like a product like a hair makeup just seemed contrived to my my life at the time but i probably should do it more now but no i do not like they're just mediums of art that you could just use to express yourself or capture a moment to archive i think it's important to do that yeah like what what is it that you love about photography is it like freezing that moment like what's that draw well, i think it yeah, well, when it comes to my eyes as a racer or former racer, you're getting that experience, you know what I mean, when you're traveling to Barcelona and you're not, you're getting the night before us eating, the people on the street, you know, in the race or at the race as an athlete, you know, the winds, the, the falls, the crashes and the parties afterwards and then the party for like the next four days while you're there, just the whole experience to archive as this is what happens instead of like some big brand telling you what happened back in the day with big gear when they try to kind of come in on it and and decimate it because it's kind of culturalist it's just piggybacking you know the culture that have preceded it so you like so the i think it's important to capture it the it's documentary. a documentary type of 
Yeah. So the the film camera is more for like documenting, and it's not it's not like super sharp and pleasant or medium format. It's kind of like running gun. And out of the twenty six or thirty six frames, I usually get like ten. Some of the other ones oh, usually grow on me, and I use them for like other mediums of art you know what i mean when i do like mixed media i'll print like this blurry red screen that's dead photo to a lot of people but i apply it to like the background of an email with like some other stuff and it lives there now and i've done it multiple times with like like assignments that i've been on where i grab like weird stuff and put it in there and like okay i'm using it so i stopped Oh, erasing cool. things or getting rid of stuff that i thought wasn't like good unless like it's that. completely black or burned out like that's dumb or white completely white but like if there's like a little bit of casper the ghost thing going out on a blown out white photo and i'm like i could pick up the bike but in the legs but nothing else because he's wearing a white shirt with like khaki so shorts cool. but it might be cool black and white behind something else yeah 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 i love the aspect of like using it like hey i've already produced it yeah i should just use it like, that's fucking yeah, awesome. Yeah, same thing with the cardboard. Yeah, same thing with the cardboard. Oh. Like, I could go buy a canvas or I get all these big boxes. Why don't I just practice? So it's always like practicing to perfection of some sort. Like, how many times, how can I tap into that flow? Mm. Like, how much do I need to practice? And now, when I look at your work, I'm like, how the fuck did you get that kind of evenly spaced? That looks so cool. Like, after you get done with it, you're like, let's practice. So I, I like you'd be discouraged to like buy canvas at the canvas or like expensive wide paper at the paper at the paper versus like, Ooh, a cardboard. And it's like this big box and you cut it into squares or you use one big piece. So I got to have one big piece over there and uh, just waiting there for me to just do my thing. You know? I love it. I completely relate to this too. So things like the cardboard, I'll think of them as very, kind of free it's like oh it's already garbage so it's there's nowhere else yeah. to go than up <laughs> yeah yeah i can nowhere to go but up upcycle yeah so it, it but then man it's really funny because if you do like if i use a new canvas or a white piece of paper even it's like oh uh -huh. shit like this is there's like suddenly a bunch of pressure to it because it's like pristine it's like it's it's almost like like i don't want to fuck it up That's yeah i used to have that weird. problem drawing i used to have that problem drawing in my moleskin book i would like always want to draw on the front page like my art before i put my little name and email and number and like times i would fuck up it would truly make me want to buy a whole another 30 yeah. dollar moleskin book they were like fuck it's so much pressure pressure but i gotten better at it pressure 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 Oh, okay, so maybe we're we're figuring something out here. So it sounds like what can help us with reducing the pressure, like you just said, is uh, you've gotten better at it, and maybe you've gotten better at it because you've practiced with the garbage. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's like a p the cardboard is like there's no pressure, so you're getting familiar with just the feeling of just doing it. Yeah, familiar with the process. Honestly, yeah. I'm not saying that it's it's not not trash to some people it is i don't see it as trash i just see it as uh something oh, that i could use metaphor you know it's a metaphor yeah metaphorically yes yes metaphorically yes because i do sometimes find a perfectly good one when I'm walking to dump the trash i'm like oh it's not in the trash yet looks clean let me get a yes. fucking razor knife and just take it dude like if it's like, not it. yeah i do that with pipes of wood too yeah Even hanging signs i see on the street like there should be no reason to have a stop sign. But like, I got a stop sign. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. that's sick. That's cool because that starts to inform the process then too. Finding all these. Those are basically the canvases. So yeah. the, the process begins with finding the thing to make the work on. And finding the thing. Yeah. You're not just buying it or just pulling it out of a drawer. It's like there's already, it's been infused with experience and energy and intention you've been like yeah. this one not that one i like yeah. that yeah yeah there's a mad scientist type of process that like goes into it but i know it and it's kind of like that'll work that'll do i love to take out like 
old picture frames I see on the street that are like in perfectly good condition. And then you just spray paint white over it, put another layer over it. And then you draw on it and you have like this cool thing happening. You know, I used to do it a lot in um, uh, Salt Lake City in my apartment. I would just like find stuff or even buy them from like Ikea and just like put art in it. Like the stuff that I would draw or like sometimes I'll find like a really cool fabric of camo and I, I'll put that in it and it yes. like looks so cool and people be like how much is that I'm like that is just like what comparably how much that is two dollars worth of fabric yeah but that's yeah. art you transformed it into art yeah it's totally art yeah I barely did anything to it but yes correct I mean what's like a silly like the Mona Lisa it's like a piece of linen four bits of wood and some oil paint like three dollars and 12 cents <laughs> it's all about yeah, the. i just struggle i struggle with value okay because of a lot of it it's just a little it's just priceless because mm -hmm. naturally in our society we think of it as trash i try to get outside of that but then once i'm outside of that and i scapegoat that i can't go far right after scapegoating it from the left and thinking that it's trash, I'm like in the middle, so it's hard for me to add value to it. And I struggle with that as an artist too, because if someone says, how much for this photo shoot I have to go through, what do you need and what do you want me to perform? When it comes to the art process, I'm just like, I don't know, 900 bucks. And sometimes they'd be like, well, that's expensive. Sometimes they're like, that's it. I'm like, uh, $1,200 and not $900. Uh, $500, you know what I mean? So you're always trying to like find something until you find a place where you're just like, I'm going to put a number out there so it'll make me stoked and may not make you stoked. But recently I've been finding out that uh, throwing those numbers out there have made me a lot, lots of, lots and lots of stokeness. <laughs> that's, that's what's up. I struggle with that too, of like, what's the number? Because to me, it's like, well, if you, you like, you throw out a number, it, it, you're not just throwing out a number, though. It has to be based in reality, I guess. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it does need to be based in reality, but you don't know what that brand's perception and how well you're going to fit to them. You know what I mean? Like, I've done some shoots where I've done a lot of shoots where it's just undercharged because I didn't really... I was just so excited to do it, one. And then the second one, I was like, I need to do this so that, like, people see that I'm a real artist or people see that yeah, African-Americans do work in this industry and I'm around and they're going to remember me and these athletes are going to remember that I was at Tour California or I shot this shot in Moab and so on and so forth because people tell me all the time, it's like, hey, man, we need more representation there. Like, representation truly do matter. You know what I mean? That's uh, one of, you know, Aisha's slogans, but I also truly, truly believe in it as well. And that's why I insist on trying to infiltrate, you know, the cycling industry while I live in the community. Yeah, it's a perfect combo. It's a perfect storm because your hand is like on the pulse, for lack of a better word. You're like living it. And then you're yeah. going into <laughs> these, I don't know, lack of a better word, like I want to say like corporate, um, like brands kind of have these little windows of what a culture like looks like. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. oh, this is this is what cycling is, and this is what cooking is, and whatever. And then I love that you're like, oh, actually, like, yeah, this is what it is, but it's actually like this. And it's like, yeah. and it brings a line back to where you're, what you live. You know what I mean? Like, that's so fucking powerful. Yeah. Fight right on. Living that life, fighting the good fight. <laughs> yeah, power. <laughs> Putting the yeah, challenge out but too. I, I, you know, I had a good time, you know, doing the things that I do, and you know, I really wouldn't trade it for the world. You know what I mean? Like I, when I made the decision to get out of uh, fashion and the footwear and kind of collide them, I kind of had no idea what the hell I was doing, and then wow. I did it with the concept team and kind of like just pushed my way with it and it went well and it was accepted pretty, pretty fast. And then I got offered, you know, the job in Salt Lake city. And then that happened pretty fast with lots of responsibility and moving parts like continuously, you know, without me 
speaking the many different languages that I had to coordinate with and and or like the cultures of the people that I was trying to coordinate. Oh my God. I didn't speak Italian. I didn't speak German. I didn't speak, you know, what I mean, Spanish. Yeah. So it was like always hard trying to decipher, you know, like what they were trying to say and how I could explain it to them simply of where we were trying to go. You know what I mean? And always, you know, kind of pushing that strategy that I created. And it, and it worked for them at the end of the day. And hopefully it's still working. Well, yeah. And hopefully it kind of like shifted their, their path a little bit, you know, like they're going it, this it, way. It truly like did. That. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we'll be a year out and one of my former uh, coworkers, he'll send me something and be like, this still, it's the ad still running. I'm like, sick. Yeah, that's sick. That ad's sick. sick. You know what I mean? Sick. You know? Yeah. So. Oh yeah. What about that? Um, the experience of looking at old work, you know, something you did like several years back. Like what do you? I do it so much. Every time I go into a file, I just kind of like look through it because I've learned how to retouch really good. I've you know I've learned the illustrator and design skills, so I've learned how to shoot raw and manual over the time and like how that process is in in Lightroom. So. I kind of go back and be like, oh man, I when I shot that, I just that those were raw photos straight from the camera to online, you know, like little right. adjustments in light, but I didn't really get into the balance and like you know like the contrast and the curvatures and like taking out some of the red or changing the reds to a little yeah. bit of more infrared. I didn't do all that, so now like my brain is trained to kind of color correct so that the product kind of makes sure it's aligned with what you would get in person and you know composition sometimes that time like i like to explore a lot so that's on on photo shoots i kind of go a little rogue and then i'm like okay let me get back to the shot list all right this shot let's knock it out so do two of the shot list and then gonna go rogue and that's more times than usual the rogue stuff always like come out people like oh that's rad i'm like oh yeah probably because it's not considered like perfectly composed Sick. And it's just like different. Love that. You know what I mean? Yeah, like that's your voice. What you just described there is yeah. your, your visual voice. And it's, you're reminding yeah. me that it's, or you're revealing that a voice can be great, even if it's, it can be better than if it's perfect. Like something that's just a little off kilter can shine so much more than what's considered like, just the metaphor of like something that's off kilter looks better than if something's like perfectly aligned. I love that explanation. Mm. And then that's, no, I, your, I get what you're saying. Like, and it's how you saw no, it. And I how you saw it was just like shifted. And that's like, that's the gold, right? Like that's the best stuff. Cause that was the best for yeah. you to make. That was the best for us to look at. Like, and it's, it's where the stars kind of like, ah! and then you're like, Oh, shot list. And you're like, yeah. rah, 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 rah. and then it's like, yeah, what about I mean, ah. a lot of creative briefs that I that I get a, in these briefs, you know, creatively, like they have like a lot of race imagery. And I'm like, oh, we're going to have to redo this because these are moments you can't uh, really capture. Yes. This dude is just ridden like 114 miles. He's on his last five miles. There's people all over the place. You know what I mean? But on this particular session, there's no one. And you, you caught him at a perfect moment. Oh, always try to steer away from race imagery. I was like, I, I can't recreate that. Like the, he's on the back of a motorcycle with an experienced handler and experienced like capture. Like if you want to like get me a motorcycle and let me test out photos for five days to get that shot, it's going to cost you. But if you want to do it, let's do it, baby. Uh, I love that. So re that's such a professional observation because it's true. They need to be in like, another place than just like you can't it's like acting i guess at that point which is possible too like okay you know like physically spend yourself you just rode this whole thing it would work better with an uh, an athlete that also acts <laughs> mm -hmm. i think cyclists know they know what they're looking at image wise yeah they know i agree yeah there's, a, some, there's is, not a lot of fake thing cool. with funk they know I they like know. that. You're I, right. Well, at least I know. And if I know, I'm pretty sure there's plenty of other people who see it and like, that ain't it. And there's a lot of oh. ain't it yeah. <laughs> out there. Yeah. Well, and then part of that I too. I make some of it sometimes. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, 
Exactly, because part of it is just like everything's fucking due yesterday. So you're just like, yo, I yeah. okay, just bop, 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 bop. Yeah. there it is. It's the yeah. tri- you know yeah. the tri- you know the triangle with like you can either have it uh, good, cheap, or fast, and you can have two, but you can't have all three. So you want fast? It's going to be you know low quality, and oh now I forget, but I think you get the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally, I totally, uh, I totally agree with what you're just what you just said. I, I do a lot of stuff when people reference concept stuff. And I'm like, cool. that took a, like uh, a couple of days. Right. That's why it's like, so good. That's how that's how we got there. Yeah. And then like the rollout, like the pool, taking like the shitty disposable camera image and putting it on the back in Illustrator and then laying photos and then doing transparency mm. grabs and stuff. That's like another two to three weeks because then you're just like wow. trying, trying, yeah. work, no. Okay, now I need two more. Now I need something horizontal with this shape. So then you take it, go into Photoshop, reshape it, drag it down and put it in the email. So, yeah. So, okay. What, what about this? I'm thinking I'm envisioning like a, a, um, a project for you that would be like, say it's specialized and it's going to be Alonzo and it's this bike. And what if it's, okay, here's a question. Do you work better with- What if it was Cervelo? Okay. I love it. P- thank you. Um, duh. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you work better with a brief or do you like to create the brief? I do a bit of both. I get their brief back so I have their true intention. No, but what I do you prefer? Of, if you can, it's just, you get a choice. Do you want someone I else? I prefer theirs. My, yeah. I prefer their brief. But I'm a going loose to naturally one. do mine. Right, you yeah. want a mine's, loose brief. Mine's in my head. Yeah. Yeah, but it's I good. I have to, a full out brief, yeah. But it's good to have something opposed to just like take some pictures. You're like, ah, I'm floating in a sea of I don't know what's like something. Okay, so here. Mm-hmm. So what if it's um, a project for you to do shoot this gravel bike for Cervelo and you have, uh-huh. I don't know, how much time do you want? You want one month or you want Ooh. two weeks? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, we'll do, we'll do three weeks. Lot. We'll do three weeks. And okay, then, three weeks. Oh, but then I guess we got to figure out what would you what would you make in that time? What, like, would it be some photo? Maybe you could make a zine. Like, what would the project be? Oh, like, what would I make? Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, or what, obviously, photos is a great lead to that. But I would definitely take that time to experiment a bit. I okay. think it's kind of cool to like just use multiple cameras or multiple like different type of equipment so I'd probably like you know start to film a little bit you know what I mean film in the early stages shoot and wait for moments and start to see the moments of you know I call it greatness or like the that sunset hour and watching for those moments you know what I mean that's why I go like scout a location it's like okay that moment's gonna be here at that time but it's gonna be maybe four feet or technically like a mile over this way where the sun's setting this one. Because usually what happens is you go to the sunset and you're watching and your location scouting and the sun is straight, right? But tomorrow it's not landing there. It's landing over here. So you have to start right. thinking about what that looks like as it lands over there and does it all over again. So there's like applications for that as well. But I, I would be able to create, you know, a full on campaign. And, and that's what I'm kind of like always geared to because it's not just, the photos for me it's the whole presentation if you went into the louis vuitton store and you bought a belt and you they handed you the belt like this that that is not okay especially with the same price you know what i mean so if you take your time and like put together something that's captivating and like really great copy i'm not like the best copywriter at all so if i have time to work with them to tell them my experience shooting them and then get the experience from the actual riders of how the bike was or how the kit felt like the negative, you know, all the, all the wins about it and produce that into releasing a campaign through email and social media or like print it. Like I remember Chrome Industries used to do like a lot of little printed goods yeah. like uh Rec yeah. and uh, like some other stuff I've even been a part of too. So I miss having like little booklets and things and 
stuff like that. And I would get stuff like that all the time back in the day. Now you, yeah. now you just got to go and download something on someone's site to look at like a digital form of it, which is still good, you know? Yeah, I know what you're saying, though, about the physical. It's almost like there's, like, digital fatigue. You're like, man, I don't know if I want to look at one more thing on here. Like, can yeah. I just, like, take a break from that and look at this? It's like a, yeah. it's such a change of pace. Did you just predict yeah. the, the rise of print? Right here, right now. February 3rd, 1987. Alonzo Tal <laughs> predicts the rebirth of print. <laughs> Oh shit! It's so print stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember when I was when I first got in photography, um, and thanks to uh, Mike's bike shop on Pika, who kind of like inspired me to kind of pursue photography. Oh, he was a big time like uh, photography uh, agent uh, had, uh, under Blur Photos, and he it actually introduced me to Song Choi, uh, who was the founder of Clay Footwear, where I worked, oh, where I started my photography career. Sick. And like he was just like you ain't shit till you get in, until you print it, and that was like the whole thing. Every like studio gallery was like, oh, this he's a printed, he's a printed photographer. Whoa. Same thing with models, like oh, I'm a printed. So now that doesn't it has very little to do with getting work sometimes. But I used to love, I still have every printed catalog of stuff that I shot for clay footwear and every other magazine. Sick. You know what I mean? Like, and it's probably still really rad, even probably even more rare now to have your stuff in a magazine. For sure. I used to kill to have something in like a loop magazine or just yeah. to be in it after yeah. I was in it. I still want to be in it. Yeah. Like 32. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to love looking through all the stuff. I can't Dude, read. Can't read. So me. good. My homies. I'm like, Dude. Dude. That magazine's awesome. Do you, I wonder if it's still around. I think it might be, maybe. I think it's still around. I think it's still around. I bought I bought an issue with, like, Mike Hernandez on the front of it. Yes. Remember Mike? Yeah. He's a cool dude. Yeah. Does I just he, seen it. I was like, I'm buying that. What the hell? He's a firefighter. Yes, that's in, right. In uh, New York. It is New yeah. York. That's what I thought. Did you know him from skating? From I did Mike? not know him from skating. Um, I met him through Masan in Emmy. Uh, no, just Masan, not through Emmy. I met him through Masan. We were in Brooklyn, and um, later down the line, he ended up being uh, on the La Familia team, which was hosted totally. by Matt Sharkey and Amanda Sandoval. when they were there doing the Sandoval. There you go. Oh, I love her. She's great. Um, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, and I, and we got a, we got closer then, and then every time I would Sick. go to New York. Me, him, and Masan would just like go hit a bar and like just chop it up and Sick. have some drinks. That sounds yeah, awesome. and that's what I love most about like the six tier community. It's like you have friends and family all over the world, and you know that to be true. Yes, you know it's much deeper than like technically the road scene when you're a road oh, racer. Oh yeah, totally. It's, yeah, so when I got out of six gear going into road, I was just like, "This is what y'all doing over here." It's <laughs> so like everyone's. Y'all need to be nice thing. to each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but like, you know, race didn't really play a big part in fixed gear culture as it did in road cycling, or you know, or even mountain bike cycling or gravel bike cycling. Fixed gear culture is just like come as you are. Yeah, and I think because fixed gears from cities, and cities are always just like this mix of stuff. Super diverse. Yep. Yeah. Hot posh of misfits, cool guys, messengers, yeah. non messengers, the best. You know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like road, how do you compare that or how would what's the compare and contrast with that with the other disciplines like road or even even gravel? Gravel's maybe in between, right? Road and like fixed gear. Gravel's still like a little bit of a long ranger. I mean, you can For have sure. a team and you can draft a bit, but once you get to like super steep or technical sections, you're kind of right. out there on your That's own. Like, good luck. I like gravel <laughs> I like gravel alone first. Oh. The, the the exploration of that being somewhere where you have to know how to fix your tire, you have to know all these things. All that is all experience from fixed gear. Just knowing how Sick. to take care of your track bike where you break it down, right. put it in a box or a bag, lie to the uh the airline agent, it's a it's a massage whatever. There were sometimes oh it's a bike. I don't know what to tell you. It's like, okay, go ahead. Like, yeah. 
Whoa, um, you're like, thank God. Get to, get to your destination. Yeah, get to your destination. Didn't spend like 150 bucks. You're like, ooh, money in the pocket. Have fun. Build your bike. Ride around. So you had to know how to do those things. And yeah. to some degree, you have to know how to do those things for as a road cyclist. But, you know, most of those dudes just kind of like drive when you're doing it kind of like throughout the country or regionally. Yeah, that is it's so true. It's really interesting. Road cycling kind of the culture is so unique, <laughs> <laughs> especially for yeah. racing. Like, I think when it gets to just, like, weirdos going distance, it's still unique, but it's it's a lot weirder then. It's not so, like... Because racing just brings out intense people, really. I don't know. Maybe that's not mm-hmm. always true. It's intense. Yeah. Yeah, man, I get my freak on when I'm, like, out there just shredding. And, you know, like I said, in that 88 bracket, like, I need to calm down, but I'm having so much yeah. fun. <laughs> like, I can't. You know what I mean? Rolling off the front, you know, calling people out. Yeah, that shit's fun. Light, lighting matches, you know, sprinting for preens. Like, I'm going to get my money back for this race. Sick. You know? Yeah. I like that <laughs> stuff, too. I like it in increments, though. You know Good what I mean? call. Yep. For sure. More so recently, it's just been like my track bike for like hitting the streets and then like gravel rides for like, you know, just a little clarity. So yeah. there's like an hour or two hour loops around like L.A. that I kind of hit continuously. They're a little technical, but now they're just kind of flowy. And, you know, I go out there, get all a little dirty, just a little bit. Come home, shower, eat, do it all over again, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, been a while. It's it's been weird not having a road bike and not caring. <laughs> You'll be care. fucking stoked though to put those other wheels on, because there's true, 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 true. road is like. I don't. I always think road is like the, the stable, the, the it's always there. Like I always like to lean on it, and I don't want to dedicate. Without completely. a doubt, I don't want one. God, there's something about smooth. I mean, and flat. Yeah, Sometimes flat is nice too, but smooth and just fast. Oh, I love God. flat and fast. Yeah. Oh God. Sometimes all the climbing. Why is there so much climbing? <laughs> yeah, no, not down. Kind of down. Well, I think the any bicycle brand out there needs to hire Alonzo to make their shit look legit. <laughs> That's right. You want the coolest of coolest, the co- oh shit, the hottest of hot, the raddest of rad? Look no further than Mr. Alonzo Tull. Yeah? Nice. That's like a scene from like a Mad Men's or something like that. It sounds very, I'm smacking. <laughs>